What is up, everyone? Welcome to week 14, our stat chasing. Got week 14 uh, coming up here. We are close to the thick of the playoffs. People have either started their playoff run or are hoping to continue their playoff run. If you are continuing, congratulations. If you've made the playoffs, congrats to you as well. If you haven't, hopefully you can still give you some relevant tidbits if you're you're playing DFS this season or are going to play any of the playoff contests coming up. But my name is Sam Hoppin. I am your host for the show. If you haven't watched before, thank you for tuning in. This is the show where I'll be going through many of the key stats and metrics that I think are important to help lay a foundation for understanding what happened this past week. It, it's pretty much the start of my research for the week to, to understand what happened and try to explain what might happen in the upcoming week and hope to do the same for you. But before I get into the details, gonna walk through again quickly the stats that I'll be using on the show today. So. If you are new, you understand what each of the stats I'm referring to are. From PFF, I get all of my routes data. So that's any metric related to routes, that's targets per route run, um, anything like that. I also get their expected fantasy points from there as well, which is a model built that weights opportunity by the line of scrimmage. I use this primarily as a measure of usage and this is not to be confused with projected fantasy points uh this is what a player would expect to get given the sort of workload he was given and the opportunity the number of opportunities and where those opportunities came from the nfl play-by-play -play data is where i get the majority of my stats that's from nfl faster i get air yards from there which is the distance the ball travels in the air before it gets to a receiver Part of that is Whopper, which is weighted opportunity rating. That's a metric that Josh Hermsmeyer created that weights area yard share and target share for a player. Also use Racer, which is receiver air conversion ratio. That's receiving yards, excuse me, divided by air yards. And that's essentially a receiver's ability to convert air yards into actual yards as a sign of efficiency excuse me, on the flip side, have PACER, which is passing air conversion ratio. It's passing yards divided by passing air yards and shows how well quarterbacks or his receivers are converting air yards into actual yards. For quarterbacks, I have adjusted yards per attempt, which is yards per attempt, but weights it with interceptions and touchdowns, giving a bonus for touchdowns and taking away for interceptions. I also use pass rate over expectation and completion percentage over expectation. P pass rate over expectation is at the team level, and that is the difference between a team's expected pass rate and their actual pass rate. And then CPOE is the difference between a quarterback's expected completion percentage and his actual completion percentage. And those are two models built into the player, uh, excuse me, the play-by-play -play data in the NFL. Finally, I have a couple of stats popularized by Ben Gretsch himself. I have weighted targets per route run, primarily use this for the wide receiver position, and this is targets per route run, but weights, air yards, and the distance uh, that a target comes at and includes a standard scaler as well. And also have high value touches, which is a running back specific metric. This looks at carries inside the 10 yard line and any reception. I'll also refer to green zone touches, which is a touch inside the opponent's 10 yard line, whether it's a catch or a carry. So I'm going to go through these position by position. As I always do, we'll have a couple of team specific situations to talk through at the end a reminder to subscribe to the youtube channel like this video become a member uh become a member to the ship chasing channel for just five dollars a month to get 
live access to this show, be able to access the Discord, which is private, and a bunch of other benefits. And a final shout out to at Change College on Twitter, who has been doing a great job helping us out with timestamps for each of the positions and team conversations. I got a lot of questions in the Discord this week about specific items and situations that they wanted me to cover today. So if you're so inclined to just skip ahead to those, you're, you're free to do that with the timestamps. All right, enough of the details. It's time to get into the important stuff. And I'm pulling up the chart here. Hopefully you're watching this on YouTube. It helps to be able to see the chart and understand where players are on said chart as I talk through them. This first one is for the quarterback position on the x-axis have adjusted yards per attempt on the y-axis have touchdown rate and then the size of a player's bubble is his rushing yards per game again looking for efficiency here because that's primarily what drives fantasy production at the quarterback position volume is not as big of an indicator as it is for the other positions and unfortunately someone who hasn't been as efficient lately is Lamar Jackson. You can see him on the chart here, way over to the right, has an adjusted yards per attempt at around four and a half yards, still a, an average 4% touchdown rate over the last five weeks. But he's he's just been a little off. And you can see it if you've actually watched the games. I know I've been watching the games. Not everyone has, but that's okay. Um, but anyway, he, he just doesn't look the same over the past four weeks. He is averaging, excuse me. Yeah, over the last four weeks, he's averaging two interceptions per game. This is since the bye. He, he missed the one game due to the, the illness. Um, so he's thrown eight interceptions since then, which is not great. Has about Has six touchdowns in that span as well. Is still throwing 230 passing yards per game and rushing it for 71 yards per game. So that's really good and was what's keeping his floor relatively high. But since the bye, he has three of his four games. He's recorded fewer than 18 fantasy points. He was below that mark just once in the first seven games of his season. And he had a spike week in week nine, scoring 30 and a half fantasy points. But since then, it's been rather disappointing for someone who you likely would have been relying on from a, a fantasy perspective. In weeks two through six, he had a positive CPOE. And since week seven, it's been negative. He has a negative CPOE in every single game since week seven with a low at negative 13 percent in week in week seven but again the rushing yards are helping he's averaging about 15 uh excuse me 13 carries per game since the buy has carry counts of 21 8 14 and 8 his last four games which is about on par with what he was doing in the first seven weeks of the the season and not that this impacts his efficiency at all. It certainly impacts his volume a little bit from a passing perspective. But before the buy, the, Balt the Baltimore Ravens had a pass rate over expectation of 0%. So they were right about at league average, which is was good. It was higher than what it had been in Baltimore in previous years. But since the buy, they are at negative 4% and starting to lean a lot more on the ground game, it seems like they're starting to trust Devonta Freeman and Latavius Murray a little bit more, which is not necessarily something I would be doing, but it, it's what they're doing nonetheless. They're leaning back towards the run. So the run, the run game will continue to keep Jackson's floor high, but I think to really explode and 
capture that ceiling, he's going to need to improve his passing down the stretch here. On the flip side, <clears throat> a player who's rushing carried him this past week, Kyler Murray, back in action against the Bears, had a season-high 10 rushes against them. So certainly there was no, no concern about trying to keep him healthy from a rushing perspective. And that helped him. He had, in the game, he had... 59 rushing yards, excuse me, two rushing touchdowns. Uh, so that on it in itself is 18 points <laughs> from a fantasy perspective. So he could have done nothing else from the passing game and, and had a totally solid day, but still threw for 123 yards and two touchdowns. Only threw the ball 15 times. And I think that was just a function of the game that they were playing. They really didn't need to against the Bears who struggled to – get anything going on offense. I think that's primarily a concern for the pass catchers in Arizona. And DeAndre Hopkins did have the one longish touchdown, but outside of that didn't really do much. So had a solid game in his game back. But in any case, getting back to Kyler, he didn't throw it particularly deep either. So it, it might might have just been a game where you know, they said, hey, we, we don't need to do a lot to win this game against the Bears. Our defense is playing tremendously right now. Murray had a 3.9 average depth of target in the game this past week. Before that, his season low was seven yards in a single game. So I'm not worried about Kyler's passing volume going down by any means because again he can he is pretty much the goal line back for that offense if it's not james connor and and that showed this past week he does still have a positive cpoe on the season has a positive cpoe in every single game this season truly playing at an mvp level when he is in the lineup when the excuse me when Kyler was out uh those Three, three games, I believe it was three games, and then they had their buy in there as well. So he missed four weeks. But in those three games, Arizona's pass rate over expectation was at 2%. With Kyler in the lineup, it was at about 1%. So they actually were a tad more aggressive throwing the ball with without Kyler. And part of that, I think, was the game situations they were in for, for some of them. But in any case, it's good to see that it didn't completely bottom out without Kyler and they're still comfortable passing the ball regardless of who's under center. You can see Kyler up here just breaking the scale on the chart here for the week 13, excuse me, production chart here. Had a great adjusted dust per attempt and touchdown rate. That, that's what happens when you only throw it. 15 times, um, Matt Jones didn't make it on the chart because he only threw it three times, which uh, I don't believe I'll be talking about later, but I, that game was just really funny. Gardner Minshew showing up here. Obviously, that was against the Jets, so sort of easy to have a solid game against them. The Eagles are entering their bye this week, and then I forget who they play coming out of the bye, but still to be determined if he'll be the starter coming out of it. The last, the one other note that I wanted to mention at the quarterback position is that Justin Herbert in their game this week had a 10, a 10.7 10 yard average depth of target, which was his deepest a dot in a single game this season. It was only the third time he's been over nine yards in a game. His previous high was nine and a half yards. And I don't think he needs to be throwing it that far every single game, but if it's at the high eights or low nines, that's where he's going to excel and truly hit a ceiling. It certainly helped Mike Williams a little bit, Jalen Guyton, some of the other tertiary pieces in that offense, but Herbert just had a 
phenomenal day, made some of the most impressive throws that I've seen all season, which he he can certainly do week in and week out. So there's a there's some concern if Keenan Allen is going to play this upcoming week. He was put on the COVID reserve list list, but I I'm pretty sure he's vaccinated, so he still has a chance to play this upcoming Sunday, which might be a big loss to Herbert. But they they play the Giants, so I'm not all that concerned either way. All right, getting on to the running back position, the most important position in all of fantasy football, some would say, maybe not everyone. But in any case, on the chart here on the x-axis have rushing expected points, on the y-axis have receiving expected points, and then the size of a player's bubble is his fantasy points over expectation. That's FPO as all refer to and this is all these are all per game numbers as well and going to kick off the running back position looking at the Raiders running backs because Kenyon Drake is now out for the season has an ankle injury and I think this opens up Josh Jacobs to and someone pointed this out on Twitter I think puts him almost in a Najee Harris role through the end of the season. Now we'll see if other running backs get involved without Drake, maybe Jalen Rashard comes back or they, for some reason, get Peyton Barber more involved. But since the week seven bye for the Raiders, Josh Jacobs is commanding 70% of the backfield touches for the Raiders has an average of 5.8 targets per game, 12.8 carries per game. So he's averaging over 18 and a half opportunities per game, has a very solid 6.2 high value touches per game. And thanks to all that is averaging 15 PPR points per game. On top of that is running a route on 52% of dropbacks, which is really solid for a running back. You can see here on the chart that he is fourth in receiving expected fantasy points per game over the last five weeks. He's averaging 9.6 receiving EP per game, which is just phenomenal. Like you don't see that that often, obviously. Um, you know, it's crazy to see, to see Leonard Fournette up there on the chart as well. But in any case, I mean, this is higher than guys like like J.D. McKissick, like Cordero, Cordero Patterson, like Najee Harris. And that's the stuff of workhorse running backs for sure. In week 13, and this again was obviously with Kenny and Drake leaving a little bit early, Jacobs had a season-high 85% snap share. He had 22 opportunities, which is – his second highest of the season coming after his most of the season with 26 in week 12 and obviously two straight games with over 20 opportunities ran a route on a season high 71 percent of dropbacks and has been above 50 percent the last three weeks also had the second most high value touches on the week with 10 in week 13 and had one green zone touch and Jacobs has at least one green zone touch in all but one game this season. And week 11 was the one time that he didn't. So this is really, really good news if you have Josh Jacobs. I don't, I'm not going to touch. I think Kenyon Drake was interesting at times for PPR leagues because he was averaging three and a half targets per game. I think Jalen Rashard is the most likely person to step into that role. But the hope is that Jacobs just takes over all of that and becomes the workhorse that we've seen him be. Staying with the AFC West, we got to see what a workhorse role looks like 
on Javante Williams and Chris G asking in the Discord if Williams' production will sustain when Melvin Gordon returns. And and I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I think it will because we don't, you know, I I, it's not go. I don't think it's going to stay what it was in week 13 going forward because Melvin Gordon is still solid. Like he's put up some solid games this year, both from a fantasy and a, a real life perspective. And I think it could be an Aaron Jones, AJ Dillon type situation in this first game back for Melvin Gordon in that game. Aaron Jones, I think had about 10 opportunities and AJ Dillon had like 20 or something like that. And, I believe it was the game against the the Rams, actually. And it was a situation where the Broncos, or excuse me, the the Packers were up so big against the Rams that it really didn't make sense for them to push Aaron Jones to get more touches. But if my memory serves me correctly, the Broncos played the Jets in week 14. So it could be a very, very similar situation to that where they ride Javante Williams, given he is healthy. But want to talk quickly about the week that Williams had without Melvin Gordon, because, you know, before I get to that, it's, you know what, let's talk about the, uh, the week that he had. So he had 32 opportunities, had over i believe over 150 total yards he had 23 carries and nine targets again mike boone was mildly involved he had five touches but williams ran a route on 64 percent of dropbacks had 11 rushing and 11 receiving expected fantasy points had six fantasy points over expectation because again like i the scoring certainly helped him but had seven high value touches, got the lone green zone touch for the Broncos in that game. Just truly a remarkable game for Williams, who is a a shining star. But what I wanted to mention is that things were starting to turn a little bit in this backfield before Gordon got hurt. So in every single game from week five through week nine, so that's five straight weeks. Melvin Gordon had outsnapped Javante Williams. And then in weeks 10 and week 12, Williams was above Gordon at 57% to 43% in both cases. So there was already sort of a changing in the guard, changing of the guard, if you will. Now, Gordon didn't did end up having more opportunities in both of those games. So he he was still involved, but Williams still got more high value touches in those games. He had four in week 10, six in week 12, while Gordon had only three in each of those two games. Williams this past week had a, like I said, a seven high value touches, which is a season high for him. And his route run rate has been above 55% in each of the last three weeks. Before week 10, it had never gotten above 45%. So that's a pretty drastic switch to see him getting all of that passing work. The final thing I'll say is that, again, they, they pretty much split the green zone touches in weeks 9 through 12. But we've seen... In other scenarios this season and the season pass about the post by Ricky Bum. And it sort of looked like it was going that way in week 12, and then Gordon gets hurt. So, so there's obviously a little credence to getting more workload in week 13, but still very, very encouraging. And if you held on to Williams this long, you are hopefully going to be rewarded for the next several weeks. Okay, the next situation I'm going to talk about, 
I, I said I wasn't going to talk about this game, but I, I forgot I, I wanted to talk about the Patriots running back. Someone had asked about this in the Discord. Obvious ca- caveat here that Damon Harris did leave the game early last night, and the total numbers for these players are going to be very skewed because all of the Patriots, I don't remember exactly how many times they ran it. I think it was like uh, 40 some, 45 times or something like that. Only passed the ball three times. They were hell bent on running. Didn't even want to give Mac Jones an opportunity to throw the ball. But in any case, we'll look at this backfield in the scope of the last three weeks because those are the three weeks that Damian Harris has been healthy. And I say that he missed week 10 and then has been back for weeks 11, 12, and 13. They enter their bye as well. So I think it's likely that Harris is back and suited up for them in week 15. But in any case, the split had gotten a lot closer between Stevenson and Harris for those three weeks Actually, Stevenson, and again, this is where some of the the bias comes in with the game yesterday. Stevenson has a 51% share of the backfield touches. Harris only at 36. And that's because Stevenson had 24 opportunities in the game last night. He had 25 in the game in week 10 that Damian Harris missed. So Again, if Harris was to miss time, then for sure you're plugging in Stevenson into your lineup. And I think early on in the game last night, Harris was getting a lot of run, pun intended. And people were sort of wondering what happened to Stevenson because he had been getting a little bit more involved, was but was just out of the question. But Stevenson had a season-high 63% snap share, which is the largest single largest snap share for a Patriots running back this season Damian Harris was at 61 percent in week four but has not been above 40 percent in the last four weeks and Brandon Bolden is mildly involved he hasn't had he he's had fewer than 10 tar, 10 opportunities in all but one game this season so he's just sort of going to be a thorn in the side of both of these guys primarily stevenson who is getting a little bit more of the passing down work brandon bolton ran a route and got one target uh so had a solid 33 percent route to run rate but again they all threw it three times um the other thing to note here though is that Harris and Stevenson have essentially split the high value touches the last three weeks. And Stevenson just has yet to find the end zone. So that should help him. He has a negative 2.2 fantasy points over expectation. So the way I'm thinking about this situation is that if Damon Harris plays, you're for sure playing Harris because they want to play him if he's healthy enough. And If he does play, then Stevenson is probably a flex option. And if Harris does not play, then Stevenson is for sure like an RB2. I don't think Bolden will take that many more opportunities from him if he is the lead back. So that's that situation. Um, Going to move quickly now to the Jaguars running backs here and had a bit of a weird situation. Um, James Robinson sort of got benched in this game and then came back late in the game. Three of his five, excuse me, three of his eight carries were in the final two minutes of the game when the Jaguars were trailing by 30 points. And someone asked Urban Meyer about that. He said, there's a running back rotation and running back coach Bernie Parmalee must have wanted to get Robinson a few more carries at that point. When I said that didn't seem wise, Meyer Meyer said, I'd agree. So kind of weird situation. Robinson had a 52% 
snap share in the game and hasn't been above 65% since week six when he was at 85% and he was at 60% or above in three straight games there. Meanwhile, Carlos Hyde was above 44%, excuse me, was at 44%, was above 30% in a game in which Robinson was fully healthy for the first time since week three. So Robinson was looking like the lead back. He had at least 15 opportunities in weeks 10 through 12 that had only 12 this past week. Robinson also had at least three high value touches in those three weeks, only had one this past week and was really locking down the green zone work as well as it was averaging one and a half this whole season. Didn't have any this past week. Carlos Hyde got the lone, the two lone green zone touches in that game. So it's, it's hard to trust. It's hard to trust Urban Meyer shocker but i you're for sure still not going to start Carlos high because the ceiling is so low he's averaging 4.4 expected points per game over his last four but robinson i think you want to hear maybe some positive more positive coach speak coming out of myers mouth this week and just pray that things go back to normal with that situation robinson hasn't also hasn't been above a 50 percent routes run rate since week six so his passing work has gone down a little bit as well so got a question from a couple final things on the running back position got a question from nomar 972 in the discord asking if james connor keeps this workload with Chase Edmonds coming back. I don't think it does. I think the big thing that will go away are the targets because Edmonds is such a good pass catching back. He went from just 1.2 targets per game without Edmonds, or excuse me, with Edmonds to 4.3 without Edmonds. And he's had five more rushing attempts per game as well, but that'll drop down to, I think, about 12 and a half, 13 per game, which is not terrible. And excuse me, he was being used more as a goal line back than Edmonds was. So that's the the hope is that the the touchdown equity stays with um with Connor. Sorry. Uh David Montgomery had 11 high value touches in week 13 that led all running back. So again, he's in a bell cow role. Sony Michelle was the guy for the Rams this week. Daryl Henderson was active, but was really only used for emergency situations. Michelle had uh, played on 97% of snaps, ran a route on 31 of 41 dropbacks, had 24 of 26 running back carries, had all of the running back targets, and had 54 yards on 12 carries against stack boxes, which is eight or more defenders. That's all from Mr. John Daigle. So again, whichever one, it's it's Michelle or it's Henderson. One of those two guys is going to be the workhorse. Final thing, Kenny Gainwell had 12 carries in the game against the Jets, but eight of his 12 carries were in the final eight plays of the game when Philly was in clock killing mode as Ben Gretsch pointed out in his newsletter Boston Scott was also not a hundred percent in this game so that's a little bit what led to Gainwell's big game all right the wide receiver position going to start this one here with the Bucks wide receivers because we now know that Antonio Brown is going to be out for at least the next two games. He is suspended for faking his vaccination card or his vaccination status, whatever it is. So the good thing is that we have a good split of games without 
Antonio Brown. And this is all coming from since week seven, Chris Godwin with the big week this past week had 17 targets. But Mike Evans still had 10 targets in this game. They're both averaging over seven targets per game since AB has been out, have a nearly identical whopper at right around 0.46. Um, Godwin is slightly leaning in target share at 24% to 18%, but Evans has a 30% area share compared to 22%. They're the only two receivers running a route on more than 65% of dropbacks, and they're both at 90% plus. They are both averaging over 13 expected points per game, which is solid. So both of these guys continue to be studs. The one guy that I do want to talk about is Brashad Perriman. He only had three targets in the game, but ran a route on 90% of dropbacks. He was at 32% in week 11. So someone to potentially keep an eye on, Tyler Johnson, his routes rate dropped from around 65% in the prior three weeks to just 14% in week 13. So it's looking like Perriman has taken over that opportunity in Tampa Bay. Speaking of taking over opportunities, the Vikings, unfortunately, are going to be without Adam Thielen. It sounds like he'll be back this season, but unknown whether, excuse me, when he will be back. And Justin Jefferson was already lighting it up with Thielen. And I don't think really his opportunity is going to get that much bigger, excuse me, without feeling. He had a 34% target share in the game this past week, 14 targets, 182 yards, and a touchdown, 35 PPR points, ran around a 98% of dropbacks, a weighted target per outrun of 0.87, just Phenomenal. And you can see him on the chart here. Like, this is weeks 9 through 13. He was already at an elite share of air yards, elite weighted targets per run, just the stone nuts for Justin Jefferson. But the guy to talk about here is KJ Osborne. He ran a route on 96% of dropbacks in week three, and that was his highest mark of the season. Highest since he ran on around 90% of dropbacks in week one, and but hadn't been above 80% in any week since then. He got had seven targets in week 13, which was his highest since week one as well, his second highest mark of the season. So I think basically all of Thielen's targets will sort of shift to Osborne, I don't expect Osborne to be nearly as efficient as Thielen has been. Obviously, Thielen's been a touchdown scoring machine. So, again, KJ Osborne, the big priority here. But D.D. Westbrook, which is kind of a weird name to say, but he is should be on your radar as well. He ran around on 60% of dropbacks, which was by far his season high. Hadn't been above 31% in any game this season. So basically double his previous season high, only had two targets in this game, but they'll need a third wide receiver. And he looks to be the one that will be stepping up in Thielen's absence. All right, going to flip the chart over to the week 13 chart. And focusing now on the Los Angeles Rams, because we now have a three-game sample with Odell Beckham Jr. on the team. Chris G. also wanted me to talk about this situation as well. And it's an interesting three-game sample that we have. Cooper Cup is Cooper Cup. Like, he's... Continuing to crush it, has double-digit targets in every single game but one this season, and can just turn turn it on whenever he wants. But OBJ and 
Van Jefferson have sort of flip-flopped as the deep guy in over the last three weeks. It was Odell Beckham Jr. in week 10. Granted, he only played for about 25% of dropbacks in that game, but OBJ has been at over 100 receiving, excuse me, air yards the last two weeks. Jefferson was at 164 in week 12 and then only 57 in week 13. And in the last three games, OBJ has a weighted targets per out run of 0.76. So really solid for him and only had five targets this past week, but had 10 in the week before Van Jefferson was at nine in week 12 and eight this past week. Jefferson is still running a route a lot more consistently. Beckham was up at 97% in week 12, but dropped back down to 56% in week 13. So unfortunately, I think Beckham was a little bit hobbled. I saw some potential reports saying that, um, which could have been that, but Van Jefferson hasn't been below a 90, 90% route rate in any of the last four games has been at 96% overall, basically on par with Cooper Cup's 97% and is averaging eight targets per game over the last three games. So Jefferson, I think, almost what they wanted Deshaun Jackson to be, but slightly better. And that's why they, they got rid of Deshaun Jackson. But in any case, I think you should be confident playing either Jefferson or Beckham as a flex because they both have, I think, a pretty high ceiling, assuming that Beckham is actually healthy going into the week. Okay, the last situation here for the wide receiver position is the Ravens wide receiver position. And this is a little less less optimistic, at least if you're a Rashad Bateman fan. And I know a lot of people here are, even though they weren't, maybe not originally. So over the last four weeks, which is when Sammy Watkins returned from injury, Overall, Rashad Bateman has some really solid numbers. He's running around 61% of dropbacks, has a 1.1 racer, 13% target share, averaging about five targets per game. But that all changed this past week. Again, he was at 60% routes run or above in the last, in the, in the three weeks before excuse me, from weeks nine to 11, Rashad Bateman was at 65% routes rate run or above. Week 12, he was at 56% and then back down to 38% in week 13. So a pretty steep decline. His targets have dropped as well, going from six in week 11 to four to just one this past week. Again, it's a situation where you would hope that the better player would sort of bear out and get the targets. Bateman had 111 air yards in week nine, but hasn't been above 70 yards in any other game. Granted, it's not like those deep targets are going to Sammy Watkins. He hasn't been above 65 air yards in his four games since returning. And it's it's one of those situations where they're just sort of splitting the, the targets between between those two guys and not necessarily giving one a big opportunity. But Devin DuVernay also <laughs> continues to be mildly involved as well. He's had targets of four, six, two, and three over the last four weeks, which again, doesn't sound like a lot, but for an offense that, like I mentioned earlier, is not passing it a ton, it, it can mean a lot, and it does mean a lot, especially from a traditionally or historically very efficient passer in Lamar Jackson. Now, Hollywood Brown is still fine. 
he only had seven targets in the game this past week, but that was after four straight games of at least of double digit targets. So Rashad Bateman goes back to someone who I'm not trusting in my flex quite yet, because again, I, I, I would want to see, I would want to see the consistent, you know, more routes, more targets, more everything, especially in an offense that's not passing it that much. This is one of the more condensed offenses with Marquise Brown and, and Mark Andrews sort of leading the way, but after that, it gets pretty, pretty murky. A couple little final notes on the wide receiver position. Elijah Moore, Corey Davis is going to be out for the season, so he'll see a huge boost. He had 201 air yards and a 0 0.9 whopper in week 13, both the highest of the week. Um, over the last two weeks, John Daigle points out behind uh, Corey Davis, with him being out, he's been at 87% of snaps, a 32% target share, routes run on 91% of dropbacks, which is obviously elite. The the big concern is he says he says Zach Lock in his tweet, but it's Zach Wilson uh, plays very much like Drew Lock, but Elijah Moore now primed for that late season breakout just in time for the ship chasing crew to hit its stride. Um, again, I mentioned Kyle Murray at the top of the show. DeAndre Hopkins did run around on 85% of dropback, seemed healthy, only had two catches in the game. So he's back to, I guess, a full workload. Again, they just want to see the pass attempts go up for the team. And finally, Devontae Parker returned as well, played, uh, excuse me, ran around on 32 of 45 dropbacks, had five targets for a 12% target share, and hauled in 62 receiving yards on, on those five targets. So solid return, not that worried about Jalen Waddle. We we'll want to talk about another one of their teammates, Mr. Mike Gesicki who continues to have just a really solid season over the, I believe this is over the last five games for Mike Gesicki. He's averaging 6.7 targets per game, has a 19% target share, 22% air yard share, 0 0.43 whopper, running around at 81% of dropbacks. This is all second on the team behind Jalen Waddell and is averaging negative four fantasy points over expectation per game. So he could be in a prime position when they return from by to have a solid week. He had a season, excuse me, second highest mark of the season with 11 targets in week 13. His rocks did drop uh, back down to 77% after hitting 90% in week 12, but that's still encouraging to see with Devontae Parker back, did have a season high 0 0.32 targets per route run in week three. But again, the issue is that he's only scored two touchdowns this season, hasn't scored since week seven. So hopefully can find the end zone when they return from their, their sweep by. I'm sure it's going to be terrible down there in Miami. Um, <laughs> Someone who's also hasn't scored, <coughs> excuse me, uh, who hasn't scored in a while that I'm much more concerned about is Kyle Pitts. Since Calvin Ridley left, who again, shout out to him, hope he's doing well, doing better mentally. Seems like he won't be returning this season, but Hope he's getting the help he needs. But in any case, since Calvin Ridley left, it's been six weeks. Pitts is averaging six target, 6.3 targets per game. Still good for a 21% target share and leads the team with a 32% air yard share. Is running around on 86% of dropbacks, but hasn't found the end zone in any of those six games. 
has a negative 3.4 fantasy points over expectation and is tight end 17 in that stretch, averaging about 7 PPR points per game. So it's it's kind of crazy because he blew up in weeks 5 and 7, and then everyone, you know, and then Calvin really left and everyone was super excited and he just hasn't, excuse me, been given the same opportunity. He hasn't had more than seven targets in a game since then. Hasn't had more than 90 air yards in a single game. Again, still running a route on a very high percent of dropbacks, but it's just, he's not finding the end zone and is only averaging about 40 receiving yards per game because he's not getting super efficient targets. So it's interesting because, so I posted a thread on Twitter this afternoon about start sit decisions right now. Like, what do you do with someone like Kyle Pitts? Because he has a ceiling. We've seen that. And he's a, he's a really good player. And the opportunity is there. I mean, six six targets for a tight end per game is a solid mark for sure. But the Falcons offense has not been all that inspiring this season. So would you rather have Kyle Pitts, who again has that ceiling, but certainly doesn't have much of a floor either, or someone like Tyler Conklin, who I believe is tight end six over the last six weeks, has some opportunity opening up for him, in Minnesota and has a couple of games over 15 PPR points. So has a relatively high ceiling, at least for a tight end. And so a lot of it comes down, I think, to what I mentioned in this thread, the mental aspect of it is, can you stomach benching someone like Kyle Pitts and then having him go off on your bench? You know, this goes back to a trade question I got a couple of weeks ago. You know, someone was between two two trades and because he had two tight ends and one of which was Kyle Pitts and someone was asking for the other, the other tight end. I was like, yeah, trade the other side of tight end away. Like you're never going to not start Pitts. And I believe that other tight end was Pat Fryermuth. And, and, and obviously Eric Ebron's been hurt, but that might be changing now. Like I, I'd probably rather start Firemuth if Iran was out and not playing. But in any case, if Kyle Pitts is your only tight end, I'm not going to the waiver wire and trying to find a replacement. That's way too drastic for me. But expectations certainly should, and I think have been temp- tempered at this point. Another stat from Daigle getting a lot of screen time here today, but 47 players have seen at least 33 targets since week eight, but Kyle Pitts is the only one who has recorded just one red zone target in that span. So again, just not getting the high value targets from Matt Ryan. Final thing, Debo Samuel was out this week. George Kittle just blasted off against the Seahawks at 12 targets for a 40% target share. 47% 47% of the team's air yards share ran around 28 of 32 dropbacks and had two backfield snaps as well. So great, great, great to see George Kittle back paying off for fantasy drafters. I realized I forgot to, to switch over to the tight end, the, the week 13 chart, but you can see George Kittle absolutely crushing it here i think he would probably be my tight end one for the rest of the season okay wrapping the show up with two team level conversations the first of which is for the cincinnati Bengals. had a request from jake stays online to talk about the Bengals pass catchers and we'll get to them here shortly but want to talk about the whole team as I always do. And unfortunately, the Bengals are back on their bullshit. Before the four weeks before the buy, they were at a 5% pass rate over expectation. But since then, 
in the three weeks after their buy, they're at a negative 5%. So Burrow is averaging just 31 attempts per game, only has three passing touchdowns, has three interceptions in that span, averaging just 14 PPR points per game, a 3% uh, excuse me, touchdown rate, and it he just doesn't have as high of a ceiling because he hasn't been that efficient, has an adjust, adjusted yards per attempt of about six yards. And unfortunately, his receivers are not helping him out, excuse me, that much. He has a 0 0.82 pacer, which is incredibly low for a quarterback. And don't know if I mentioned this, but has a 14 PPR point per game average in those three games. He does have a 6.2% completion percentage over expectation. So still completing passes at a pretty high rate. But if you've been carrying two quarterbacks, I think there might be better options available at the position. As far as the running back position, we know, again, they, they've been running the ball more. They've been very comfortable with Joe Mixon. Mixon's averaging over 25 carries per game over the last three weeks, has 78% of the running back touches in that span, is averaging 19 expected fantasy points per game, and has recorded the touchdown in, I believe it's nine straight games. Yes, nine straight games, just absolutely crushing it. Has only been above 100 rushing yards twice this season, and two of those came in weeks 11 and 12. So it's certainly, and part of that's because of the volume for sure, but he still is just not getting a ton of passing work. He has just five targets total in his last three games. The only other thing that I'll mention about this backfield is that Samaji P. Ryan, I'm fairly confident, is the handcuff to own in that backfield. I think now is a time where you want to be targeting handcuffs. If they're not your own, then certainly of other players. So he's been, he was at a 34% snap rate in week 13, has hovered around 30% all year has seen boosts in snap rate when Mixon has gone down. So certainly someone to keep an eye on. But getting to the important part, the pass catchers of Joe Burrow, because I think people are worried about Jamar Chase and you know, I've been saying it for weeks. Those drops are going to come back to haunt them. They're going to come back. I've been saying this literally for 200 weeks, just saying the drops are an issue. No, I'm kidding. Um, but they sort of have been. He's only averaging 41 receiving yards in his last three games. And his production has come at the expense of T. Higgins, just absolutely crushing it over the last couple of weeks, averaging 19 PPR points per game as a 28% target share, 43% air yard share, a 0 0.69 whopper, 14 expected points, 14.8 expected points per game, averaging over eight targets per game. This continues to be one of the more condensed passing attacks, which is really, really good. Both Boyd and Chase are at a 19% target share over the last three weeks since their buy, Chase still has a an edge in air yard share at 28%. But again, the the drops, he, he dropped a long, what would have been touchdown. And his numbers have dropped a little bit since before the buy. Before the buy, he was averaging eight targets per game. Excuse me, back down to 5.7 in week three. And his weighted targets per run has gone from 0 0.65 down to 0 0.43. They're still all running around on a very high percentage of dropbacks. Chase at 96%, Higgins at 92%, a 
and then Tyler Boyd and, and CJ Ozama, who I should mention, a 85% as well. Ozama did have six targets this past week, which was tied for a season high for him. Higgins had 14 targets, which is just the third time that he's been in, in double digits, but was his second most of the season. And Higgins, again, I mentioned the air yards, but Higgins has over 100 air yards in five of his last six games, while Jamar Chase has been at, well, he's been at 30 or below in two of his last five. He's been at 85 or below in three of his last five. So this is not, I, I would not be worried about Jamar Chase. I think things will turn around. I hope that the Bengals turn around and pass it more again, like they were before the bye. I think they got scared off a little bit after the the Chargers loss. Uh, excuse me, no, the Jets loss. Uh, that's what I'm thinking of. Um, but Tyler Boyd continue. It's he's still sort of the third fiddle here. He he's always been second or third in in targets and target share. Doesn't command a large percent of the air yard share, and doesn't have a receiving touchdown since returning from the bye. So it's, you know, it's a matter of two of Jamar Chase not scoring as many touchdowns. He has just one touchdown since the bye and was averaging 0.8 touchdowns per game before the bye. So those will turn around. I'm not worried. You, you, you're, you're happy if you have Jamar Chase as one of your receivers, but Let's wrap things up here with the Detroit Lions. Congratulations to the Detroit Lions and Jared Goff for winning their first game of the season against the Minnesota Vikings. And it's funny, I reflected back on something I said earlier this season that Jared Goff could potentially be a really solid fantasy quarterback because he was had so much volume and you know, he was being, he wasn't being super efficient, but he was getting the volume and that just obviously has not been the case, um, hasn't been efficient throwing the ball on, on the season. But since their week nine bye has been pretty good, averaging 1.7 touchdowns per game, about 30 attempts per game has a 5.6% touchdown rate a 7.1 adjusted yards per attempt. But again, that's only helped him get about 12 and a half PPR points per game. And they have just committed to the run even more on the season. They have a negative 5% pass rate over expectation. Uh, that's the Lions. But since they're by, they're at negative 11%. So it's uh, they certainly are committed to the run. And... Who's been the benefactor of that? It's been their running backs, or has it? Um, so DeAndre Swift was out this past week, missed most of the Thanksgiving game in week 12, and a lot of people thought this was going to be the Jamal Williams show, but it was, it was not. Uh, he only played 47% of snaps, and Godwin Igwebuke, Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, had a season high 39% snap rate. Jamar Jefferson down at just 11% and hasn't been above 20% at all this season. And the notable thing here as well, in addition to snaps, is that Iquibuque ran around on 58% of dropbacks, which is the highest mark for any non-swift running back in on the Lions this season. He did only get four opportunities, and Jamal Williams got 18. He had 20 in week 12. So he's still getting the majority of the work and is being used when he is on the field. But 
Igwe Buke, someone certainly to keep an eye out. And if he's on your waiver wire, definitely worth an ad because it looks like he has probably eclipsed Jamar Jefferson as the handcuff, the handcuff to the handcuff, if you will. Um, and, and we're not sure how long Swift is going to be out as well. So something to keep an eye on in that backfield. But I want to talk quickly to, again, to round out the show about the pass catchers for the Lions, because they are going to continue to have to pass the ball a decent amount. And Amon Ross St. Brown looks like now he is the wide receiver one for the Lions. He had a season high 12 targets in the game, the highest mark for any any pass catcher, uh, I believe, any wide receiver or tight end at least, uh, in a game this season, ran around on 100% of dropbacks, has been above 80% in every game since week six, has been above 90% in each of the last three weeks, and is really coming on in his last four games, has a 24% Target share, a 0.49 weighted targets per out run, and is averaging over 11 expected points per game, right on par with his 11.7 PPR points per game. So someone to potentially consider in, in DFS, again, worth an ad, I think, as a potential flex option. TJ Hawkinson has bounced up and down quite a bit. He, It's been a little weird for him since... The buy over the last four weeks, this is the, the number of targets he's had. He's had one in week 10, which was really weird. Then he had eight in week 11, three in week 12, and eight again in week 13. So he still has an 18% target share over that span, averaging five targets per game, but clearly does not have the ceiling that he had before the buy when he was averaging, you know, eight plus targets per game and seemed like the focal part of the offense, still running around on 88% of dropbacks and actually led the team, second in the team in air yards in week 13 with 88, just behind the 90 for Amon Ra St. Brown. And last thing I'll say about St. Brown is 2.273 targets per out run was his highest mark of the season. So he's getting used when he's on the field and the Lions seem to like him. I know there was some coach speak or uh, I guess QB speak earlier this season about golf wanting to get him more involved. And that looks to be coming true. That is going to do it for the show today. Hope you all enjoyed it and learned some new stuff that will help you in your matchups this week. Be sure to tune into the show tomorrow night, 9.15 p.m. Eastern. As always, I will be back here at 3.15 p.m. Central next week. Good luck. Stat that.